science during suborbital flight, and life in a faraway ocean world. You're listening to Are We There Yet, the radio show exploring space exploration. Hi, I'm Brendan Byrne. NASA is giving scientists the chance to conduct experiments and research on suborbital flights like Blue Origin's New Shepard capsule, and one scientist is gearing up for the ride of his life. University of Florida's Rob Furrell will be launching on a New Shepard rocket and testing what happens to organisms on Earth that make the journey into space. There's no escape in the fact that I'm happy to be me. We'll speak with Furl about how he's preparing for that trip. Then, scientists are looking at distant icy moons for signs of life. On Saturn's moons Enceladus and Jupiter's moons Europa, microbiological life may be under the surface of icy oceans. We'll speak with NASA's Alexander Pavlov about his research on these distant worlds. That's ahead on Are We There Yet? How do you prepare for a trip to space? University of Florida Distinguished Professor and Assistant Vice President of Research Rob Furrell is doing just that, ahead of his flight aboard a New Shepard capsule. And liftoff. Mission Control confirms that New Shepard has cleared the tower and is headed to space. That's what it will sound like as Furrell makes his journey from West Texas to beyond the boundary of space, where he'll experience microgravity and view the Earth from a new perspective. But it's not a joyride for Furl. He's conducting an experiment that could one day help scientists better understand how humans could survive and thrive in space. Here to talk about his mission and how he's preparing for it is Rob Furl. Rob, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you, Rob, because you've got some exciting news. You're going to space, right? Can you tell me about that moment you you found out that that you were getting a ride on on a New Shepard rocket? I'd be happy to because it's it's one of those incredible moments that that gets fixed in time in your brain and in your memory. And yeah, I still have the email that said basically in a fairly clipped manner. Hey, Rob, congratulations. It looks like you're going to space, probably. <laughs> and an email? <laughs> can you can you imagine getting an email like that? <laughs> Not at all. I, I would love to, but no, I can't imagine that. <laughs> but seriously, put yourself in that frame of mind. You get this email, you've been working on it for years, and then all of a sudden, you're sitting there all by yourself, and it's a reality. For you, is, is this moment exciting because you personally will be taking this trip, or is it because this line of research that you've been working on uh, for such a long time is going to get an opportunity to go to space. Who are you more excited for, Rob the person or or, or Rob's research? <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy for Rob the kid. I'm happy for, for Rob the scientist who many of us out there are thinking, you know, it's great working with professional astronauts. You get to hand off your experiment to somebody who's righteously trained and a wonderful human being for doing their work in space. But there's always that thing that says, boy, if I could do this myself, yeah, it'd be cool. And I think it might even be better science with with my brain in there. Don't mean that in an egotistical way. But yeah, I'm happy for all of us in the community that now see there's a route to space just because you're curious and just because you have perseverance to write proposals and get funded to do work in space. It's a whole new avenue. So yeah, I'm happy for the community, but there's no escape in the fact that I'm happy to be me. <laughs> and, and I'm happy for you, Rob. I'm a very excited. <laughs> Let's talk about that experience because you mentioned, you know, it's it's going to be easier with, with you having your hands on it. Tell us a bit about what you will be researching from this suborbital platform. The research is, is funded under technology development uh, program in an office called Flight Opportunities at NASA. What I'm working on, what I'm working with is a series of sample handling tubes that are designed for operations in space. They're called KFTs, Kennedy Space Center Fixation Tubes, and they've been a, a staple scientific tool on the International Space Station and dating back to uh, the space shuttle. But they've never been used in a commercial suborbital vehicle. They've never been deployed in a way that allows us to use their sampling capability on the way to space and on the way back from space. The flights like I'll be taking on Blue Origin's New Shepard offer us the ability to basically biochemically freeze samples at various portions of the flight. And so I'll be able to 
test what happens in this case to the cells of a plant. During the ascent phase under high G, then I'll collect samples again after the microgravity portion is over and capture some samples again after we return to Earth. So for the first time, we'll be able to have subsampled the various portions of a entry into space and return from space. And what are you hoping to learn from this experiment? What What is the research question? What gives us as human beings the idea that we can survive and thrive off the surface of the earth? We've grown up here, we evolved here, we know how to live here. When I say we, I mean we as terrestrial organisms. As biologists, we want to understand the physiological adaptations that it takes to live in space so that we can can do it well. And for me as a fundamental biologist, I'm also interested in understanding what are the limits of life as we know it here on Earth. So I'd like very much to understand the adaptive process that happens to an organism, basically any terrestrial organism as it rides a rocket into space. Is there a cost benefit to this platform, Rob? I know it is it's extraordinarily expensive to send a science experiment up to the International Space Station, and access to your data takes a, a very, very long time. But also, these suborbital flights aren't cheap as well. Could this be a way to kind of get over the hurdle of the cost of space research? By and large, the answer is yes. And there's no question that all sorts of suborbital vehicles, be they parabolic aircraft, be they uh, rockets like uh, New Shepard, they do very much offer the opportunity at a lower, much lower price point to find out whether or not your science can be done in space, has some benefits to being done in space, and would return results that are, are worth a larger investment. There's absolutely no question that part of this world is in creating access to deep space, to low Earth orbit, by creating access to microgravity for shorter periods of time. I also will argue that these shorter flights, these more accessible flights, the ones where the idea is these people will be flying on a very regular cadence, the ability to do science quickly, get your data back quickly, and fly it again in short order. I think we're going to see that being developed in these suborbital platforms long before we'll get there in the orbital world. You're listening to Are We There Yet? I'm Brendan Byrne. We're speaking with University of Florida Distinguished Professor Rob Furl about his upcoming flight on a new Shepard space capsule. Rob, let, let's talk a bit about what you have personally had to do to train yourself as a research participant, and then also what you've had to do to you, modify your experiment for this upcoming New Shepard flight. What has the process been to get ready for launch day? For I think most of us that, that have had any opportunity to send experiments to space at all, the difference here is pretty pretty dramatic. For example, the process of designing an experiment that's doable in, in this case, the New Shepard capsule took a lot of work back and forth between Annalisa Paul and myself and the others in our laboratory that are used to handing off experiments to somebody else to figure out how to do in the space station. We had to figure out how to do it within within the capsule. This was a long process. We're several years into figuring that out, and, and it took a lot of collaboration a lot of good work with Blue Origin in this case to work with us to understand what it would take to do an experiment of the kind that we do within the vehicle that they have to safely operate. That was probably the biggest thing to get ready. So that's that really requires us to operationalize things that we would normally hand off to somebody in space to do to actually get those operations to be able to work within the time frame and the safety constraints of their capsules. For us to get me ready to fly, it's actually pretty interesting. Most of, most of what you might consider training for an astronaut over time has been part of our laboratory culture. We've flown in uh, parabolic aircraft and zero-g aircraft for, for decades. So, so the concept of being in microgravity physically as a human being is something that all of the people in our lab are pretty familiar with. So we're, we're not stepping into that environment with no sort of physiology training. 
The high G environment that'll be experienced there is something we also replicated with fighter jet aircraft out of KSC in order to understand the physiological pressures that'll be on me on other other people in in the capsule. So the physical training has just been a part of our culture and has been something that we've acquired over time. The biggest thing that we've done is to work through simulations of the flight second by second from beginning to end so that we could know just how many times we could sample, just how many how much time it took to sample, how to do the communication so that we know the sample's been taken so the crew on the ground can do a replicate what we call ground control. And that has taken several trips out to the West Texas launch facility that Blue Origin has there. We've been in their simulator many times, and we've built sort of a lower fidelity simulator right here in the lab where we run videos and go through all the actions right here on a daily basis so that we can prepare for the flight. And finally, Rob, what about psychologically? We have heard experiences from people that have taken this exact same flight and have just been in awe by the view and the change of perspective. They get that overview effect that we've we've heard from astronauts. If I were in your position, I feel like I would forget to do the experiment because I would be looking out the window. <laughs> how, how, how are you preparing for what, what could essentially be a life-changing experience for you, but you're up there to do work. So you've hit on what I think personally is one of the most important aspects of all of this, and that is how to combine the richness of the awe expected for the personal experience to the requirements to actually do work with a brain that is focused and hands that are working and eyes that are taking data. How really do you manage that stuff? And, and to give you some insight, first thing I did, I've done is um, I've talked to a number of astronaut friends to understand what their experiences were, what, frankly, what it did to their heads to go to space. And it's it's enlightening, it's comforting even to hear the personal feelings that, that others have dealt with on their way to and back from space. The other thing we've done is we've engaged sports psychologists, somebody that works with athletes that have to do, in effect, something similar. Imagine yourself being a, an Olympic gymnast, which, of course, I would never <laughs> be able to be, but I... But I can imagine they have a short period of time in which to derive enormous focus to do incredibly important physical tasks while also being able to step back for at least a few seconds and appreciate where they are and what they're doing. So there are good practice mental state activities that I've learned about that I hope to engage during the flight so that I can get the job done change over and think about what I'm seeing out the window and then re-engage to get more work done and enjoy the process while also succeeding at it. I don't consider that a trivial undertaking whatsoever. And I absolutely and quite honestly would sacrifice looking out the window to be sure the job is done. But boy, I don't want to do that. But you've built some time in to look out the window, right? That's the important thing. <laughs> absolutely. Every second is scripted with deltas, places for things to, to shift back and forth. Yeah, I intend to look out the window because that view is what I will personally take back more than the feeling of being in microgravity. It's the view for me. We've been speaking with the University of Florida Distinguished Professor Rob Furl. He'll be flying on Blue Origin's New Shepard rocket, the first research-tended suborbital flight. Rob, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate you having me. Have a great day. Still to come, Jupiter and Saturn's moons may have life beneath their icy surfaces. Life as we know it require liquid water, so uh, that by itself makes those moons a prime target for uh, life search. That's ahead on Are We There Yet? You're listening to Are We There Yet? I'm Brendan Byrne. Millions of miles away in our solar system are two freezing moons with vast oceans beneath their surface. On Saturn's moon Enceladus and Jupiter's moon Europa, scientists think that amino acids may exist beneath their surfaces. NASA Goddard Space Flight Center's Alexander Pavlov led a research paper about these moons. 
which argued microbiological life could exist. But to uncover that evidence, future missions would need to drill through icy surfaces to see it. Pavlov joins us now to talk more about these icy worlds and the possibilities of life. Alexander, welcome to the show. Thank you for this opportunity. Well, Alexander, let's start by talking about Europa and Enceladus. These are two moons uh, that are quite far away from Earth, and there might be oceans beneath their surface, but specifically these two moons. Why are, are you looking at them for, for possible signs of life? Uh, as you said, there might be oceans. We, it's not might be. We, we are confident there are. Yeah, so for, the, for this particular moons. On Enceladus, we actually see the liquid water shooting uh, from the South Pole. Uh, on Europa, uh, there were evidence for the plumes uh, shooting water out, but it's much more sporadic. Uh, but from the magnetic field measurements, we know that there have to be a liquid, uh, a liquid ocean right underneath the ice on Europa as well. So essentially, you have two ocean worlds. Life as we know it require liquid water. So uh, that in itself, by itself, make those moons a prime target for uh, life search. You describe these environments in a way that sounds quite inhospitable, uh, right? They're, they're icy. They've got these plumes that, that spew out of there. Um, is this kind of a, an extreme environment within our solar system? And, and how might there be life in, in an area that spews these water geysers out of it every so often and is, and is frozen? Well, it's, it's, it's inhospitable in our view at the surface but not, not under the ice. I mean, we have plenty of uh, life uh, in Antarctica under, you know, under glacier lakes. You know, there is uh, life deep in the ocean, which uh, have barely any light whatsoever. You know, so it's not, uh, it's, if, if you sit on the surface in life as we know it, we'll, we'll have troubles. But once you go deep in the ocean, uh, under the ice shell, there's plenty of uh, terrestrial microorganisms which, uh, which can handle it. Up until this point, Alexander, how have planetary scientists like yourself made these observations on Europa and Enceladus? How, how are you so sure that there is water there? And, and, and how are you able to paint a portrait of, of what this environment looks like from all the way here on Earth? Well, telescopes, <laughs> they, they do the job. Uh, the, the most recent was uh, amazing uh, images by James Webb uh, telescope looked at the uh, actually, at that shooting plume from Enceladus, that's directly. But even before that, uh, there were observations uh, of uh, kind of a uh, similar type where you, you actually see this icy, well, the liquid water immediately become ice as it shoots up. Then there were measurements of organic molecules in the, by Cassini uh, instrument, which has mass back in the, in the earring of the of the Saturn, which we think now is being feeding from these plumes from Enceladus, and you, you see organic molecules in there. So uh, then you look also before that, before we had observation, people were looking also at the at the surface of say Europa, and they are looking at particular features on the surface like tiger stripes, and they were looking at uh, how they can be formed, you know, by cracking the ice liquid water coming in and crack again and again and again. So there's a, a fairly mature body of evidence. People are debating how thick is the shell on both planets. But again, from the magnetic field observations of Europa, you can tell that there have to be a liquid conduit and underneath the, uh, the ice with ions in it. When it's moving, it's producing specific magnetic field. This is another type of estimates which uh, scientists use. Even though, we, even though we directly didn't drill, well, hopefully we'll drill at some point, but uh, not anytime soon. Uh, but there is a way how you can tell remotely that uh, there should be a massive oceans underneath those shells and on those icy moons. So, so you mentioned you're, you're using telescopes for, for remote observation, but also getting data from, from Cassini, the, the spacecraft that, that was um, living uh, around Saturn for, for quite a few years and, and taking observations. Um, but obviously, you, you, you want to get there and, and you want to crack that, <laughs> crack that shell, right? Tell, tell me a bit about what a mission like that would, would look like for both Europa and Enceladus to actually get something, air quotes, on the ground, looking at, at, at what is beneath that, that surface. Well, the biggest challenge for Europa is the uh, obviously radiation environment there. As I said, when we are thinking about uh, inhospitable environment for life, uh, you know, it's not so much temperature. So we worry about radiation. You know, this is what our 
paper is, is also about. Uh, on the surface of Europa, uh, it's in the radiation belt of Jupiter. Uh, and the uh, uh, fluxes of these ionizing radiations are tremendous, so it's very difficult for equipment would would be, you know. So that's a, that's a challenge. On Enceladus, you know, it's far away, you know. The, uh, so it's a major investment to get them in there. But in my opinion, based on our studies, we're well worth the risk because on Enceladus, and you can preserve the science of life on the surface where you can sample it. Obviously, uh, drilling is a very energy. Uh, consuming and therefore uh, energy, uh, very expensive enterprise, uh, what you're going to do in any of those missions. So if you don't have to drill and you still can collect valuable information, that's a major, major uh, boost, uh, you know, for the for the mission, you know. So that's what our paper was kind of was about. We discovered essentially that on Enceladus, you don't have to dig at all the biomolecules will preserve essentially right under the surface. And even on Europa, even though it's hotter there, there are locations where those uh, those molecules can be preserved. You know, we're fairly close to the surface. So uh, Europa is hotter, but still doable. You're listening to Are We There Yet? I'm Brendan Byrne. We're speaking with NASA Goddard Space Flight Center's Alexander Pavlov about his research about the moons of Jupiter and Saturn that may have life thriving beneath their icy surfaces. Tell me a bit about some of the findings in, in the paper. What do you hypothesize that is allowing those molecules to be preserved at the surface? When we're looking at life, we're not looking at the actual um, living, moving organisms. You know, we, our approach is kind of based of life, what we know it is that they all have to use the amino acids. We were basically asking ourselves if, if life is present on those moons, how long the biomolecules, which we think would this this life will be made of uh, would would be able to preserve on the surface? How long does it take? You know, at, and at what depth uh, we will have a significant fraction of these molecules relatively intact, le- relatively not affected by radiation? So that was the point of the study. Uh, but but the the approach itself was uh, life as we know it all made out of nucleic acids, amino acids. Uh, kind of a very specific set of biomolecules. So we don't obviously know exactly what would be alien life made of, but if it's organic based, it's logical to assume that something similar, something similar molecules. So if we find uh, find their uh, kind of depth or environments where they can be preserved, that's good for the life detection. And is there a sense that if you are able to find those amino acids, those kind of building blocks on the surface, that could mean that there is something more complex? beneath the surface? Yeah, so, so amino acids by themselves are, can be fairly complex molecules, you know, that are small amino acids are more complicated. But uh, what most was most special about amino acids in particular is that they uh, have a chirality. It's left-handedness and, and right-handedness, you know, it's so the type of orientation of the molecule itself. And all life as we know it is made out of left-handed amino acids. We, we are not taking uh, any right-handed uh, amino acids in, in any cells, whether it's human body or E. coli bacteria uh, or elephant or bird. Uh, it's, they're all utilizing left-handed amino acids. And uh, in nature, the proportions are much more even, left-handed and uh, right-handed, like say in meteorites. So imagine you arrived on the surface of Europa or Enceladus and find these amino acids and they all are either left-handed or they're all right-handed. That would be a pretty darn big uh, indication that that's, a, that's actually a biosignature. And how soon might we be able to confirm something like that? <laughs> Alexander, I know that there's, there's a lot that needs to go into that and, and essentially you'd have to send something out there. But I mean, are we talking in our lifetime that you'll be able to get the answer to that question? That's, that's part of the rationale for the study is to show that such missions, they don't require drilling. And if, uh, and if you don't require drilling, uh, well, well, maybe that, you know, that prompted uh, to, that it's not as expensive as it would be. Our job is to put NASA in the best position to make this decision to go there and to motivate, you know. So this is what the paper is about, you know. And you know, currently there are no missions planned to go and sample, you know. Yes, it is my hope <laughs> that during our lifetime we'll be able to do it, yeah. Yeah, it can't be too difficult to send uh, something to go sample out there, right? Super cheap and super easy. (laughs) 
Alexander, I, I, you know, your your focus on, on this paper and your and your current planetary research now is on on Europa and Enceladus, but but your main background is on Mars, um, which is a much different environment than these two moons. Can you tell me a bit about how you transition from Mars to places like Europa and Enceladus? Well, the my interest is in finding life in our solar system, right? You know, whether it's past life or current life, and uh, on Mars. You're right, that's a planet mystery from all standpoint, but the current missions have mostly focused on the finding evidence of past life, because when, back in the past, Mars was warm and wet, it's dry right now, and there, there are still locations where you have liquid briny water present, but mostly it's a, it's a dry planet with just ice in the, in the polar regions. In contrast right now, if you're interested in something which is living right now, both icy moons, they have entire ocean liquid. Uh, obviously, that makes it a, a primary interest uh, for, for astrobiology. So I'm not limiting myself to one planet, even though Mars will be my, my first love at all times. But, you know, the, the Enceladus and uh, Europa, they're, they're very, very tempting targets. Finally, Alexander, I ask you this question knowing it is... Um very speculative, but for planetary scientists like yourself who are on the hunt for life in the universe, I do like to ask this question, and, and that is, where is the best chance for us to find that evidence? And how soon might scientists like yourself find the answer to, are we alone? There is a, several questions in that question, right? You know, in terms of the where best find and how soon we find might be not, you know, the two different questions. In terms of how soon probably we will have the best chance if life is there we'll find it on mars this is a life search missions probably in a decade from now uh, missions uh, in the planning right now like mars life explorer and this it's nothing certain yet you know about those you know but in terms of best chance for, for life to be that's probably icy moons they're much much uh, further away and that the uh, mission will take longer uh, in planning and execution but that's the best chance of uh, of actually finding, but we will be able to have we'll have a, a life search mission before that uh, to the Mars. Well, I'm fascinated by your research and, and appreciate you sharing it with us. Alexander Pavlov is a planetary scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center on the hunt for signs of life in our solar system. Alexander, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. That's going to do it for this week's show. If you're not already, be sure to subscribe to the show's podcast feed so you never miss an episode. Do that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Stay connected with this show. Be sure to follow us on social media. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook. We're at AWTY Space. And if you got an idea for a future episode of this show or you want to join us as a guest, reach out. We're at AWTY at cfpublic.org. More space coverage online, cfpublic.org slash space. Are We There Yet is a production of Central Florida Public Media. Our producer is Marion Summerall. Our intern is Sophie Diaz. Editorial guidance from LaToya Dennis. Support for Are We There Yet comes from our listeners. Until next week, I'm Brendan Byrne. Thanks for listening.